to welcome you all to the final webinar in our three-part series, Navigating the Experiential Learning Triangle. The first webinar did look at universities' perspective and how they can really succeed in that. Then we looked at universe, uh, employers, and we're finally here to look at students. So to begin, just a quick housekeeping, like I said, we are recording, so I promise that I will take this recording edit it and then post it on our YouTube and send out also a follow-up email to anyone registered for this event after within 24 hours. So be on the lookout for that. You'll definitely be able to access the PDF of the slides as well as the recording. And please, please, please ask questions throughout the webinar. You can post any questions directly to the Q&A and I have left 10 full minutes at the end to discuss. And even if we go beyond that, I'm happy to stay on longer to discuss as well. So uh, to begin, like I said, we are in part three of navigating the experiential learning triangle. We're looking at how students can access and succeed at virtual internships. And really, as our audiences for universities, we're not giving students the tip, but we're giving universities the tips on how they can support students in accessing and succeeding at virtual internships. The first thing we're going to do is to succeed, what you need to think about is are you embracing virtual opportunities? I know that potentially three months ago or a year ago, your university, yourself, or more, have all decided that no, virtual opportunities weren't for students, weren't for the university rigor and more. And so this really quick pivot over the last three months has maybe taken some people by surprise. Um, but I really want to emphasize that if you aren't embracing the opportunity, if you are looking at this as a quick band-aid, you aren't going to set your students up for success. You're not going to build longevity into the system, and you're not really going to highlight the key opportunities that this opportunity really exists, right? Um, so that includes accessibility, the opportunity to build work, remote work skills. Uh, it creates opportunities despite global events, which is mainly why all of you are here, right? We're looking at how can we support students despite everybody being remote this summer and beyond. And Virtual opportunities are the future of work. So really we need to get into that mindset that we aren't creating a Band-Aid, but we're creating an opportunity that will remain for the future um, beyond COVID-19 that students can access. And that these opportunities are really great. Um, they're not going to replace in-person internships. I don't think we're going to a world of 100% remote, but I am believing that the remote world will become increasingly more remote opportunities and it will be more important in the workplace. And to really hone in on why this opportunity is so great, uh, when COVID happened, we actually reached out to a lot of our alumni, um, having done this for the past three years, and asked, did a virtual internship actually support you in preparing for COVID-19 and succeeding through there? And we had a wonderful testimonial from Sean from Queen Mary's University of London, who really articulated that he was able to understand digital organization tools better and navigate that through COVID-19. He applied strategies to operate in the workplace that he took from his virtual internship and applied it to the future. And he was able to engage virtually through video conferencing and meetings readily. And of course, what we wanna get from all internships, whether it's in-person or remote, was he gained technical and industry specific skills. And so really, even if you're on the fence, I promise virtual opportunities are wonderful and they can be a great foundation for a student needing um, access to an opportunity but is uh, unable to travel to it, or a great opportunity in times of COVID where all students are really needing a virtual experience. Um, and so when we're looking at how to support success, we also have to just say, say what the fact of the matter is. A virtual internship is not the same as an in-person internship. And yes, while years of foundation supporting an in-person internship can really lead you to great success thereof, you do need to alter your program support to deliver a quality virtual internship and to support your students in succeeding in a virtual internship. So if you are just saying, I have 10 years of in-person internship experience and I'll just use those tools and I won't adapt and everything will be fine, you might miss a couple cru crucial details in supporting students to really um, succeed and flourish under these virtual times. I know that when virtual internships started, we did take 12 years of experience from CRCC Asia and applied it. 
And then through the past three years, we had to evolve a lot because an in-person internship didn't just translate to a, a virtual. And so in looking at this slide, what I've done is I've looked at the opportunities and threats that really exist for in-person, virtual, as well as for both. And you'll find that you still get direct industry exposure, increased transferable skills, career exploration, exposure to professionalism, as well as workplace communication, which is all really crucial. And a virtual internship can also allow more structured project-based assignments, exposure to digital tools, and access to new opportunities that a student wouldn't have been able to access had they needed to commute or relocate in the, uh, in the past. But there are the same challenges that exist for an in-person and virtual still, and that could be supervisor engagement, having the student unpack those skills gained that can be really hard for them to at articulate those transferable skills once they're done with their internship and move it to future career management. A lack of presence, an intern can get lost in the experience and an internship is really what you, you get out, what you put into it and having a student who's disengaged or lack of presence can really be a concern in person and virtually. And of course, this understanding workplace culture, which isn't always discussed to the full extent it could be, um, but can be really challenging for both in-person and virtual internships. So furthermore, we have other challenges for success. Um, students need increased initiative. Uh, networking isn't that cool water cooler networking, that ad hoc, you ran into someone in an elevator. It's more structured and it is limited. Technical issues now can halt work. Um, yes, you could argue that in-person Wi-Fi down can halt work, but it really can make it uh, jarring if you're all if you're isolated and have no tech support. And finally, of course, you have that student risk isolation. When they're doing an in-person internship, especially at bigger companies, they have networking events, group activities, and more. And if you don't have that in virtual internships, you have that risk of the student feeling very isolated and alone. So if we know the challenges and the opportunities, the first step that we really need to do to have students succeed in virtual internships is really just to build access. Like I said three months ago, some universities might not have allowed virtual opportunities. So the first thing you need to do is just make sure you understand how remote opportunities are shown on your handshake, simplicity, your website, and more. Are students able to filter remote opportunities? Uh, are employers able to post them? Is one faculty saying virtual internships, another saying online internships, the third distant learning, and the fifth um, remote internships? Are we all using such different vernacular that there's not common resources being shared or searched on their campus? Also, develop a plan to engage providers. I know providers can be tricky. Um, I am a provider and some people are really against using it. But right now we're looking at COVID-19 impacting internships across the board and you have a surplus of students who previously might have found their own internship or have engaged with career services and alumni to find their placement, getting lost in the shuffle. And if you don't have that third outlet of providers and you haven't actually engaged them so that you can vet them to your needs, you can make the pricing point and identify the contact at the university to really support this, then you're really just letting any student access all these different providers and not putting your stamp of approval on it. So develop a plan and engage. And finally, build tools for students to understand the opportunities that they can access um, and really understand the benefits of that virtual internship. It goes back to embracing it and then promoting it. Once you've built the access, also consider your resources. As I said, virtual internships are different, but you still have that foundation of in-person internships. So look at what resources do your career services already have to train students on teamwork apps, Zoom, remote work, and more. Do you also have faculty already teaching internship courses that can be adapted for online, um, online internships? And do you already have a standout alumni or engaged employer skilled in remote work that could potentially become your advocate, your spokesperson, or deliver webinar best tips? Use these resources to the best of your ability and don't let them fall to the wayside. And finally, don't assume. When I prepare host companies, universities, and students for internships and virtual internships, a lot of times I'm talking about very basic ideas, communication, structure, and more. And a lot of the feedback is, well, isn't that obvious? And I think it goes back to don't assume what an intern actually already knows and how they're actually taking in the experience. I'm sure you've all seen this recent article about Zoom fatigue where it shows that video chats are actually more exhausting than in person because 
so many things are hidden beneath the surface. There's no nonverbal cues, you're missing tone and pitch and more. So if you know that when just a Zoom video, you can imagine that a student working virtually who may have limited work experience prior is getting fatigued just trying to experience all these things, communication, how to understand technology and more. And so don't assume a student knows how to communicate through chat or through email. Really take it down to that basic. Don't assume that everybody always used a chat function and we have a young generation that we're supporting in university, so of course they can adapt to all our technology. They probably can't. They actually might need that, that blueprint on how to access the different platforms and engage them, them and use them daily. And so making sure that you know that a virtual internship misses a lot of these social clues, just like a Zoom call, and preparing your students to really give that foundation will help them succeed in the future. And so knowing that assumption, what I've articulated is those five kind of impact points that you can look at the foundation of your intern for internship for success, as well as provide a couple of resources. So when you're looking at the internships, ensure that the opportunity has been clearly noted the best communication platform. So prior your job descriptions or when a company presented you an opportunity to promote an internship to your student, you were really looking at that job description, the hours worked in the location. Now you need to ask, how are they communicating? What are they needing to communicate? And really ensuring then on the flip side that you provide resources to train your students on Trello, Slack, Zoom, Suites, Microsoft Teams, and more. Because if they can't communicate daily with their uh, internship supervisor and colleagues, they're gonna fail, uh, regardless of anything else you do. And so don't take that communication for granted. Don't assume they have access or understanding to it. Really create that guide. Also have employers commit to frequency and a type of communication. And on the flip side of that, support students in understanding what quality supervision is. Having never done a virtual internship, if the employer checks in with them weekly, they might assume that's good, that's normal, that's okay. But if you've actually already created a guide that says this is a quality supervisor, this is a quality internship, and they can refer to that, they'll know when things are going awry and when things are going wrong, and they'll be able to reach out and seek support. And of course, just like an in-person internship, provide students with the professional communication resource guides that cover um, email communication, best practices for chat meetings and more, so that the students have that foundation that they can apply to in-person and virtual opportunities. When you're looking at technology, make sure you have all job descriptions, just like those communication platforms, identify the technology required. This is an access concern. Prior, you would have looked at um, location. You would have looked at how many uh, staff are in the employer, uh, in the company, health and safety, and more. But now you need to look at is technology a barrier to the delivery of the internship? And have you provided students with the resources and funding opportunities where they can access high speed internet, laptops, and additional resources? As an employer, they are already assuming that the student has access to this because they're a university student. But what we learned during COVID-19 is a lot of university students don't have access to this. And if we haven't given them the resources and clearly identified it, we've set them up for failure. Also ensure that the employer has provided the tools and resources for technology troubleshooting for the students and that they provided it early on. Conversely, you might not have the ability to reach out to each every employer and really check that this is getting happening. So on your end, identify tech support and resources on your campus that the student can still access during their internship, because this will be crucial for them to have a second resource to turn to should things go awry. And finally, you guys are the best prepared university staff to support virtual internships. You have honestly just navigated virtual work, some of you for the first time ever in the last two months. So identify challenges that you just faced in adapting to this and solutions that you have found and create your own cheat sheet and best practices. We've always found that personal stories and anecdotes really tell um, impact uh, success and impact the ability for us to digest this information. And so create your best practices because you just navigated this and you are more prepared than ever to support a student virtually. Also, create opportunities for feedback. So reach out to engaged supervisors to understand when and how they're gonna be providing feedback. 
And if they need that support, make sure they have feedback templates and tips because if the student is not getting feedback throughout their virtual internship, they have no opportunity to improve and apply those improvements. So we're gonna to need to make sure that you aren't knowing that once again, that student knows what a quality internship and supervisor look like in that feedback loop. And then the supervisor is supported in that too. But beyond that feedback, feedback can come from more than just your supervisor. It can come back, come from peers. It can come from yourself. It can come from others out externally. So identify ways students can engage in discussions outside of the internship through group support, webinars, and more. And either you need to create these opportunities for students to give feedback and connect with their peers uh, through group discussions or webinars, or if you don't have the resources, times, or ability to do that, at least create an opportunity to connect them to it. So identify multiple touch points or webinars happening where a student can, can then go engage and really join the discussion. Because once again, we have that risk of isolation and we have the risk of a student just working with that supervisor. So it broadens that network, it gets them that feedback to improve, and it lets them make sure that they're building a community virtually. We also want to expect, uh, manage expectations. And so this is hard because it's a lot on the employer side to manage the cultural communication and time expectations. But what you can do is you can ensure that you have guidelines for virtual internships just as you would for an in-person and that they've addressed the many differences of in-person and virtual. Don't just take your previous guidelines and write the word virtual at the top. Really think about why was this a guideline for in-person and it's it still meeting the needs when you go virtual. Also, provide a checklist to the student to really know what a positive virtual internship is and what the student should look like. Give them the opportunity to explore and know for themselves and reach out to you if they need assistance. Also, vet internship opportunities that are remote, ensuring they have a clearer and more defined project plan. Um, like I said, the, one of the opportunities for a virtual internship is that uh, greatness of really defined projects, right? They can't get pulled into ad hoc work because they're not present. They can't go copy. They can't file in more. They also can't just do any, uh, any old project. They really need that structure. So you need to make sure that post on your handshake, simplicity, and more actually have that structure. And you can even go a step further in providing um, project plan templates and more to help the employer design a really successful structure so that the intern can then succeed at the internship. And finally, workplace culture. Like I said, I think this is not talked about enough when we're discussing in-person internships. And a lot of times we're looking at a culture and we're thinking, what are the perks? Uh, do they have a kombucha tap? Do they have a ping pong table? And we're not actually discussing the culture that really exists within working. And so when you're looking at here, ensure that the internship does go beyond direct interaction with one supervisor, but engages the student into the entire company. Um, for that, you might provide tips to the company um, to how to integrate the intern, or once again, you'll have that resource of a best internship for the student to really note, oh, okay, wait, in a good internship, I have access to multiple communication channels and colleagues, and so maybe I should ask for that and make the student the advocate of their experience. Also, in Handshake or Simplicity or more, you can require more than one contact to be listed um, on remote opportunities to make sure that they always have uh, support and that they're not only reaching with one person. And finally, ensure that the intern is supported by the supervisor and yourself to explore what workplace culture means. If you haven't already been doing this with in-person internships, you probably just need to think, rethink the whole thing and create a guide or add it to your internship curriculum or more so that students can really understand what a workplace culture is and explore it and how it benefits their success or them not liking a certain job or aspect thereof. And so it's really important as internships are a lot about skill development, but even more about career exploration. And if they're not understanding this key facet of career exploration, both virtually and in person, we might be failing them. And so really, if we can create these resources or find these resources to share with students, we can then know the five, the many tips to tell the student to succeed, the employer, and the university. And since this is the final webinar of our three-part series, I decided to kind of write out my best tips for both the student, the employer, and the university, looking back at the last three. And so with a student, I would tell them, 
to succeed in an internship virtually, you really need to master the mode of communication. That's not just the platform that you are communicating with, but it's also how you're communicating, both, both professionally or um, uh, uh, in more casual jargon or more. Also to make yourself known, right? Looking beyond just working with your supervisor, but building a network and really making it you have presence in your internship. The intern should also clarify their projects and availability so that anyone can really know what to expect. They should also schedule check-ins. They shouldn't just wait for an employer to schedule check-ins. They should go at it and do it themselves, showing that initiative, which is the final and the biggest piece to a virtual internship. Take initiative, show your worth, show your presence, and always be connecting. The final um, piece for employers is to really communicate clearly and frequently. Employers should also create structure and a project plan. They should engage the student in the company and not just with themselves or their team, really building it big so you get that workplace culture, that networking, and the lack of isolation. They should establish cultural and professional norms and expectations, and they should give the intern access to technology early on and clearly. This should probably happen even before the start of the internship so that the first day they're not asking for passwords, they are already connecting with you and beginning work. And for the university, to succeed, to support successful virtual internships, A, make them accessible like I mentioned. Did you actually go through and double check that you can sort by remote opportunities and you can post remote opportunities? Are you promoting this as a quality experience to students or are you yourself still apprehensive? Identify all your resources and take advantage of each and every one. We don't need to reinvent the wheel just because we went virtual. We need to take our strong foundation of in-person internships and adapt them to the, be the best sor sources of um, support for virtual. Uh, like I said, embrace the virtual opportunities and how great they can be. Create resources and guides for students or we have multiple universities. We all don't need to create multiple resources. We can share best practices and create guides that each student can access and really learn from. Also, don't forget to support your employers. They are a little lost in the virtual opportunities as well, and unless you really engage students, universities, and employers, the triangle's not going to be complete, and you will have some holes in the, the internship. And finally, schedule virtual events for the students to engage in to ensure that they're touching back with the university and not feeling isolated. So knowing all this, and the fact that I went three minutes over my 20-minute discussion, I will open it back up to just any and all questions. And I can see that you have added a bunch to the chat, and I thank you for that, as well as questions. And so the first question we have is, do you plan to prepare interns for techno technolo technology environment? Um, so a lot of times people don't think about um, technology, how you prepare them to working with virtual opportunities and more. And so at virtual internships we do, not only in our curriculum do we give access to little guides about each technology um, that we've experienced, like I said, Trello, Slack, the big names, we really just get the student thinking about technology, making a little checklist before they start to really know, okay, I've ticked off all these boxes, I'm prepared not only just to begin work at 9 a.m. tomorrow, but also log into my chat function, log into my email, and connect. Technology is hard, and so you do need to really prepare them to uh, embrace all aspects, too. I would say one of the greatest things that happened because of COVID-19 was my entire company went from never turning their video on in any chat, even though we're all remote all the time, to, to doing what we all seem to be doing, spending hours on Zoom with video. But that video helped connect more and it helped us unpack one more aspect of our culture. And so allowing a student to understand the benefits of the technology and how it can really um, show them to embrace the culture, the colleagues, the network and more is really crucial. But we do take technology for um, granted a lot because every day you and I log into a computer and we have to do it. Or a student is, was only logging into Blackboard or something else when they needed something, but they're not actively engaged day to day in the technology. So do prepare them, create resources, create a platform, and make sure it's really in the forefront of their mind 
that two weeks prior to starting because once they start, if we haven't addressed technology, they're going to be two weeks behind. Uh, and the next question is, I'm wondering about the importance of providing closed captions for group discussions on Zoom. Do you recommend it and what is the best practice? That is a wonderful question, Martha, because what we're, we're talking about is accessibility and closed captioning can really help a lot of accessibility. But at the same time, we're talking about resources and that can be difficult too. And so I do recommend that you try to make every opportunity as accessible as possible. That's looking at time, that's looking at connectivity of internet, and that's looking at did you provide closed captioning, did you provide other ways for a student to connect. Um, the best practice would be probably error on the side of more connection than less, and so then you would do um, closed captioning. But as you can see, my webinars don't have closed captioning right now because I don't have the functionality or the resources to do it. So do know that you should try, <laughs> but that there are sometimes limitations, and people do understand technologically um, limitations, and as we get more and more into embracing virtual opportunities, there's gonna be more opportunities um, for tools that really make the easier solutions. The next question is, what about any students that are applying as individuals rather than through a university? Are you able to offer enough level of support? Now, I'm assuming this question is about a provider. Um, so we could look at it a couple ways. So is an individual student able to get the same support as they are with the provider if they're not going through their approved university channels? Absolutely. The program is the same for university partners and students that have individually found any provider, and that support is really going to be there. What you're not finding is that a university working with a provider is able to say, these are my standards at my university. This is how many credit, uh, how many hours you need to get a credit. This is the um, experience that the student needs to get. These are the career fields we want to look at and the majors we want to touch upon. And so if you don't have that university saying the alignment, a student might not be able just to take that experience and apply it for credit back home. Um, or when they're meeting with their career services, they might have a different resume rubric than the other students who went through a university. Those are gonna be the big differences there. When you're looking at students applying as individuals directly to an employer, um, are they gonna have enough support? That's a really great question as well. And then that's the student really identifying their two main supports. One, a student often, if they're circumnavigating their university, have left out the fact that universities have a lot of supports and they should be utilizing them. They shouldn't be going around them. And so you should go to your university and your career services, your faculty and more to really get the support you need to succeed at the internship. And within a company, you should be supported through really strong mentorship of your supervisor, as well as being able to reach out to other departments like HR for additional support. So in all these things, if you are able to identify the support channels, you can get the support you need, whether that's through a provider, university, or student. Um, another question is, I want to know if virtual internships will be the one to provide a platform between the host company and student, or will the host company provide it? So in our sense as a provider, virtual internships, we are the mediator between the host company and the student and the university. And so we're the one really providing those templates like I talked about, the project plan template, a feedback best resources, um, trainings and more for a host company to really engage with to deliver a really quality virtual internship. And so we don't ask host companies to deliver more than they need to. We ask they, them to define a really strong project. We ask them to be quality mentors to our students and we ask them to partake in training so that they can be better mentors and deliver better projects as they progress and take on more and more virtual interns. But we don't ask them to do additional work to support the student in coming with things from scratch. We really are there to provide that support so both the student and the company are able to deliver these quality metrics. Uh, another question is a really good one to end on is, do you have access to web, the webinar one and two of the series? Um, they're all on my YouTube channel and I've been sending them out 
um, in the emails that follow this. So if you attended this webinar, I will be sending um, that email within 24 hours, and it'll not only link to this webinar and the slides from this webinar, but it'll link to the recordings of the past two so that you can readily see all three back to back. And that really brings us to noon. And so that means that we are at the 30 minute mark. And I do always want to end right there and then to promise, um, as I promised. So I, to end, I want to thank you all so much for the amazing engagement that you have given us over these three webinars um, to really touch upon the experiential learning triangle. Um, your support of webinars really made us create a whole other series uh, to talk about the student, um, to really engage students. So this is delivered with the student as the audience, exploring reasons to consider virtual internships, how to succeed in a remote internship, and applying those transferable skills from when they go virtual to in-person later on. So I will send a flyer with our follow-up, but do promote this to any student who would find this interesting. If you would like to stay on the line, of course, I do have more time to answer questions. So I'll continue going through the Q&A until it really empties out and then close the um, webinar. But please ask any and all questions while we continue. And uh, the next question we have is, what about courses that need hands-on training, like front office, culinary and engineering? Um, how would a student get trained virtually? And that's a wonderful question. And there are ways that virtual engagement of education and work can just be just as great as an in-person. There are, of course, barriers as well. And you're looking at engineering, they're not gonna have all the tools, the tech, and more that a company could offer you when you're looking at this. And so there's gonna be limitations with some hand-on aspects. At the same time, if a supervisor is willing to engage through Zoom trainings, webinars like this, um, calls and more, you can still get very much trained on a lot of the key aspects there, as well as once again, developing that foundation of transferable skills so that they can take what they knew to then rapidly adapt to in-person internships once they're allowed to proceed. And so you can take an engineering internship that's virtual, get a lot of the spec, uh, spec skills and do a lot of the technical um, computations and more, and then when you're able to go in person, you can then do the hands-on activities. Culinary, you can learn about the business side of things, how to run the business, the um, supply chain and ordering food and more. Virtually, you can do courses online as well, where it's video, everybody does cooking classes, and then you can move to that uh, hands-on teaching in person once it's allowed. But there are ways to navigate virtual experiences to be very high impact and you just have to be a little creative. And so I know there's a lot of times we think, well, this couldn't possibly be virtual, um, but they, there is opportunity to do that. And so we do have to just know how to use the skills and the technology we have to really adapt to that. Um, the next question is, would international time differences most likely be a hindrance to a successful virtual internship? How can, oh, okay. These are two questions, sorry. Would international time differences most likely be a hindrance to a successful virtual internship? So it goes back to that point that virtual internships really allows you to look at the what of work and not the when of work. With most companies that offer all staff remote work anytime, they also have a couple other perks. They have unlimited time off. They don't usually have those traditional nine to five hours and more. They ask to connect at certain meeting times, but outside of that, as long as you're making sure that you do the work, it's not when you do it, once again, it's what you do. And so an international time difference might not be the hindrance that you really see in a virtual internship. It might actually be the experience that really sets students up for really strong communication. Working with virtual internships and CRCC Asia, I'm lucky enough to work across the world. Um, I get to deal with time differences daily. And in the past three years, what I've learned is, one, how to communicate better and clearer. Um, my communication, because I'd write an email knowing that I'm going to bed, and if I wasn't really clear with that email, with that ask, and provided all the resources, then if I woke up 12 hours later, I would get a question back instead of an actual answer or deliverable back. 
And so my emails went from being these two sentences to really clear points and giving background information and more. I became a better communicator because of my time difference. And so students actually are able to learn through this as well. And by completing across time differences, yes, they might have to meet outside of those nine to five hours, right? So a student in New York might have to meet with their Japanese colleague at 9 p.m., which seems ludicrous, but that one hour of connectivity will allow them to with unsupervised work the same as well because they're doing project-based work. They don't need to be su supervised minute by minute. They need to be supervised daily and connect. And while they're getting supervised at a distance, they're gonna build up skills of initiative, self-motivation, communication, and problem solving. So it won't be a hindrance, it'll be a benefit. And then if you're looking at how can a freshman network without necessarily interning? And that is a great question. How can you virtually intern? There's a lot of opportunities to do career exploration, even if you're not going to do an in-person or virtual internship. One, you can engage in different webinars like this. This is a great way where you can then say hi in the chat. Hi, I'm a freshman. I joined this webinar to learn more about engineering. If anyone would like to connect afterwards, let me know. These are really low buy-ins where you're getting skills if you're sitting there for 30 minutes, but at the end, you might have five different colleagues that you can then co-connect on LinkedIn and say, hey, I saw that you added some very great points during this webinar. I'm still exploring this. Do you have 10 minutes to give me to an informational call? So it would be a lot on the initiative of the student to do these virtual experiences. On the flip side, universities are getting more bold and grave with their virtual opportunities and they're doing more career fairs virtually, networking sessions and more. And so there's really great great best practices getting developed from there that would really help a student access these different opportunities and network um, very well. Yes, it's going to be hard, but to be fair, networking in person is hard, right? It's a hard thing to get over that and put yourself out there and learn your elevator pitch and more. And by doing it virtually, it does let you type, refine, and really kind of get that, that direct question out there. Just ensure that you support your students and not reaching out to 100 people saying, hey, can I meet with you for an hour um, to discuss career um, benefits, right? That's not going to be an ask that's answered very often, and it's not going to be one that's seen as a value add to both the employer and the student. So really kind of nurture with them with understanding what um, informational interviews are, what virtual internship, uh, virtual networking is, and how they can best deliver on it. The next question is, apart from the internship placement and instruction on using tech tools for their virtual internship, will students be benefited from any other values? Uh, in doing a virtual internship, you're getting the same great values as an in-person. You are still getting this network of new professionals to understand. You're getting career exploration and industry exploration and really learning to understand the jargon, the project cycles, the communication styles and more that go within a specific industry or company. You're also getting values of career management, work ethic, right? You're now having to work by yourself and not so much supervised, right? So you are gonna have to take the initiative, take the ownership to deliver on these projects and more. And so they do go beyond hard skills and those industry skills that an internship placement gets. And you're getting a lot of those transferable skills that you'd get in an in-person internship some more refined than others. The next one is, how do you ensure cross-cultural skill building? And that's a great question. And so first is, is this one of the, the key points that you'd like in your internship? And if you have a group of students, then you can really create a series of activities, engagements, and discussions that unpack that cross-cultural, right? So when we're looking at virtual internships, our students are placed in companies across the world. So first we need to discuss the hard skills, right? How do you access technology across the globe? How do you communicate across the globe? And how do you work across different time zones? And then the next piece would be looking at how can you look at the culture of the company you're working at and the country you're working at to get those clues about what's, dry, what's the driving force and motivation behind things. Is this a collectivist culture or an individualist culture? Are we looking at a vertical hierarchy 
are there different communication lines getting crossed? And so you can have these one-on-one -on -one engagement with students, or you can create more group activities that allow them to unpack these experiences. While there's some amazing cross-cultural skill building in study abroad that really needs the student to be in person and team, you can replicate these in Zoom with slight modifications that allow them to still do the exploratory work of that virtual internship and the culture and unpack them. It also gives that great foundation. So a lot of questions that keep coming our way when we're talking about virtual international internships is, well, is it like an in-person internship? And you will never get the same experience of an internship in, with an Italian company as you would going to Italy and ordering your espresso the first day and getting overwhelmed by the crowds, the people, the, the kerfuffle, um, and by walking away and being, thinking that was amazing, right? There is nothing that can replace in-person experience of travel. But you still, in both in-person and virtual, need to give the students the roadmap to pick up on these different nuances so they can really start unpacking them and then understanding them so that they can succeed in their internship utilizing this understanding. And so providing those roadmap, those engagement opportunities, those teamwork building experiences and getting those sessions happening, you can do that both virtually and in person to allow success for the future. And then a final wonderful, oh, sorry. Uh, Final wonderful question, I think we're there, is will you provide a copy of the PowerPoint and recording? And I promise, I promise, I will provide both to you, all um, attendees of the webinar that you can share out and more once we are done. I think I only see thank yous now, so please let me know if I'm missing a question. But other than that, once again, we do have these student webinars coming up. So please promote out to your students. Like I said, I will send out a flyer. I do want to thank you for your overwhelming support and engagement with this webinar series. It's been really fun to curate and deliver, and I hope that you did get something out of it. Uh, you guys are an amazing um, support to have for students right now, having navigated virtual work for the past three months. And I know that you, uh, we are all in the best foundation that we possibly could to continue supporting students for virtual work for the future. So thank you all. I hope you have a wonderful Tuesday and uh, look out for an email with all more details.